On today's episode, Joey Logano turned into Scott Dixon. Welcome back to The Break Hard Show. I'm Matt. So this weekend, we had all three NASCAR series in Nashville. The Trucks on Friday, Xfinity on Saturday, Cup on Sunday, as well as the Austrian Grand Prix for Formula One. It's the middle round of their triple header right now. They'll be finishing that off at Silverstone next weekend with the British Grand Prix. And I'm sure there will be no vitriol headed into that after Max Verstappen took out Lando Norris, racing for the lead late in the Austrian Grand Prix. We'll get to more of that in a moment. We'll start with the NASCAR Cup Series race, though, because it's finally, mercifully, over. 300 laps was the scheduled distance. They end up going 331, 15 cautions for 79 laps, five overtime attempts. And Joey Logano finally managed to win that race. I mean, he turned into Scott Dixon. He went, what, 110 laps on a tank of fuel? Something that they didn't think was possible. It might have actually been 112 laps. Now that I think of it, regardless, he went about 15 mm, ish or more laps further than they expected him to go. Chris Gabehart, Denny Hamlin's crew chief after the race, said the reason he was able to stretch his fuel is because he went S L O W slow. And he's not wrong. I mean, the 22 did a great job conserving all of their fuel in maximizing their attempt to win a race. And they finally did that. So credit to Paul Wolf for taking an absolute flyer and leaving Logano out there. Even after we saw the five car run out of fuel, we saw multiple other cars run out. Denny Hamlin, Martin Truex Jr. pitted underneath the uh, second to last caution there for overtime, whatever. And they came in to make sure that they were going to at least have enough fuel to finish. And hopefully maybe chaos would ensue in front of them. And it almost did, honestly. But five Five overtime attempts, not one, not two, not three, not four, five, when all LeBron James, Miami Heat right there. <sighs> I'll be honest, I, it's a super unpopular take. I know that. I'm willing to have that unpopular take. There needs to be a limit on overtimes. And now I know everybody in the mentions, trust me, I got ratioed on Twitter when I said this. Uh, everybody's going to be like, well, what happened in, remember what happened in 2015 when Harvick, you know, wrecked? wrecked uh, Trevor Bain on the restart attempt right there to make sure that the race is going to finish. Yeah, I know what you're saying, and that should have been a penalty in the moment. Now NASCAR has SMT data on all these cars, and they can have uh, wheel trace, throttle chase, everything that they can track this and be like, yeah, dude, you intentionally did this. That's a penalty, and they can put a parameter in place to make sure that, that does not happen again. But five overtime attempts, and don't get me wrong, right? This is the anomaly. This doesn't happen very often or ever. This is the most attempts that they've ever had before. We've seen races devolve into absolute chaos and amateur hour at the end of these events before. Coda last year is a perfect example of it. Brickyard 2017, another great example of that as well. And those races devolved into chaos at the end of regulation. That's what we want to call it. And then carried over into multiple overtime attempts. Never got to five, but it still is... A precursor to that. So I get it. People aren't going to be happy about the limit overtime attempts, but man, five just felt like too many. And it becomes a crapshoot at that point, too. I mean, we're 31 laps over the advertised race distance. We're halfway through a stage, not really about a third of the way through a stage, but it just felt excessive in the moment. And honestly, I thought the racing was actually not that bad. A lot of people were talking about how the first half of the race was bad. I can kind of see that. Like, it wasn't the best race I've ever seen, but it wasn't certainly the worst race I've ever seen either. It was okay. And why Nashville isn't in the playoffs, but Loudon is going to be next year, is baffling to me. Because if I'm SMI, I would much rather go to a destination race like this. And I get it. You have to compete with football season, the Titans, not Vanderbilt, but probably Tennessee in that state. And then, of course, you have the IndyCar final there as well. But I'll I'll be honest, if NASCAR wanted to go to the playoffs and or put Nashville in the playoffs, that IndyCar race is getting booted. Like, it just is going to happen. The NASCAR race is going to sell a bunch more tickets than the IndyCar race. And I love IndyCar. I just, you have to look at it from a business standpoint. But it's not going to be loud and will be in the playoffs instead. But Nashville, for the most part, again, it's 40, what, 40 miles outside of actual Nashville. It's the Santa Clara of NASCAR tracks at this point. They show all these highlights of Nashville, and you're like, buddy, we're in Lebanon, Tennessee. Show me Lebanon, Tennessee. I also find it hilarious that everybody's cool with going to Nashville, even though it's far outside of Nashville, but we can't go to Kentucky because it's too far outside of Cincinnati. It's not that much further than what than what Nashville is. Nashville Super Speedway is from Nashville, but I digress on that one. The race, however, uh, Chris Bell wins the first two stages. Looked like the car to beat. Then he gets impatient in stage three, ends up wrecking himself. Not ideal in that situation. He even said so after he got out of the uh, infield care center. He's like, I got too aggressive, which Chris Rebell being aggressive is hilarious because he's the most like level-headed, quiet-mannered guy you've ever seen before. He also had another Denny Hamlin, Kyle Larson run in. And Chris Gabehart came on the radio and told Denny to stop playing grab ass. They'd figure it out after the race. And they 
had another bit of a run in on a late race restart in the overtime where Larson was trying to ship the 11. And this is how you know Kyle Larson doesn't intentionally, you know, try to wreck people very often. He couldn't figure it out. He went all Dan Kapatrick, went into the corner trying to move the 11 out of the way ends up losing the front of his own race car and taking Ross Chastain out. So maybe he owed Ross for Darlington last year, but his intention was the 11. He got the one. So he got half of the number that he was hoping to get. He was like, I need double ones. I got one. I guess I guess it counts. And then after the race, he said that he didn't want to do that. Obviously, he didn't want to do that. And then he runs out of gas as well, coming to the restart. Didn't want to do that because then it ends up taking Kyle Busch out of the race. Kyle Busch had an abysmal day. He was running back in the 30s. And then they flip the stage, or they flip the strategy, rather, get him track position. Now he's running top five. Okay, so this is why this car is also kind of iffy still, because that guy was running 30th, couldn't pass anybody, puts him up in fifth or fourth, and he can't get past now. Now he's a, a top five car. Okay, so track position matters a ton, especially because of the arrow factor. So, Kyle Busch is in position. Then there's a wreck, the Ross Chastain wreck. Kyle Busch hits the wall, is part of this wreck. He hits the wall to avoid it, and he should have been back in probably the 20s to restart. NASCAR moves him all the way back up to fourth in line and said that he wasn't part of the wreck, that he slowed down to try to avoid the wreck, and when the field was frozen, he should have been fourth. I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. We saw them do this last year at Chicago as well. When people got caught up in a wreck, they moved a whole bunch of people back up in the running order, even though they got caught up in said wreck. So they've done it before. So if we argue about, oh, there's you know, inconsistency. This is actually kind of consistent. We just don't see it happen very often. Jeff Burton was furious on the broadcast. Coming back to the green flag, they mentioned that Marty Snyder did. And Jeff Burton goes, that's ridiculous. And then they started calling the race. And I mean, I can honestly see both. I can see both sides of it. I would tend to be on the side of like, you were in the wreck. Uh, it didn't matter at the end of the day. He ends up getting caught up in the Kyle Larson running out of fuel. Wreck on the front stretch right there. Gets turned in the outside wall on the front stretch. The crowd cheered, flipped him off, everything like that. Kyle got out, gave him a wave, and then just got in, his, got in the ambulance, went to the infield care center got in the car and left just an absolutely abysmal day for the guy needed a good run like that just wasn't going to get it on Sunday you also had Carson Hosovar relapsing he back to his old ways again he hooked uh Harrison Burton in the right rear and spun him out under caution now it was under caution and people are like somehow saying that, that it's okay that he did it because it was under caution it's not okay that he's done it the guy has a long history of hooking people in the right rear and turning them head on into things. Thankfully, Harrison Burton to get turned head on into the wall or another car, but you still can't be intentionally spinning people out on the backstretch under caution. I don't care if it's under caution. You can't do that. But in typical Carson Hose of our fashion, he relapsed. NASCAR did say they would take a look at it, and it should absolutely be a penalty. You can't let this kid come down here or come up to the Cup Series and continue to do the same sophomoric nonsense he was doing down in the Truck Series. And he only ever got a two-lap penalty in the Truck Series, and I think he did it at least three times that I can remember, hooking somebody in the right rear and turning them into the wall. Just dumb. All you have to do is not do that, and he continually does it. So Harrison Burton, and everybody will keep saying on the internet that Harrison Burton brake checked him. Harrison Burton didn't brake check him and cause Carson Hosovar to turn left and hook Harrison in the right rear. No, Carson Hosovar made a decision in that moment to do that because he throws temper tantrums sometimes. Uh, so all of that <laughs> to, to say Nashville was crazy. Typical, you know, people that go to Nashville, a bachelorette party, girls going for the weekend. Nashville's not ready for us. Yeah, they've never seen just generic white girls before in their life. They're more than ready. I'll be honest. I don't think Nashville was ready for the chaos that came in those five overtime restarts. That was just a lot. Yes, the Austin Cendrick spin with uh, two laps to go in regulation. That should have been a caution. He's spinning down the backstretch with cars passing him. Yes, that's a caution every single time. People on the internet were like, that shouldn't have been a caution. It, it should. Like, There's times where I agree with you that it shouldn't be. In this instance, you need to have a caution for that. The Josh Berry wreck in overtime as well that set up the final restart, I believe. That also should be a caution. Um, the fact that on the last lap, coming to the white flag and the last lap, I'm pretty sure there are three separate incidents. None of those got called for a caution is baffling to me. NASCAR was like, listen, we're tired of this nonsense. We just want to get this over with at this point. Which does lead me to believe that even they were tired of the overtime process at that point. And I get it. Talking about overtimes real quick. Fans want to see a green flag finish. I absolutely understand that. 
but at some point you got to save the inmates from themselves right like you can't r let them run the asylum somebody said they should go to the arca rules uh, the arca rules is it always has to finish under caution even if there's a caution on the white flag lap re-rack them go again has to finish under green and that is we're looking at a lot of wrecked race cars but at the end of the day, Joey Logano survives, stretches his fuel further than anybody else thought that he absolutely could have. Tyler Reddick should have won that race, and afterwards, he was super upset with himself. I haven't seen that guy that down uh, ever. I mean, he looked like Morgan Wallen after he found out his ex-girlfriend had a new boyfriend, so he looked bummed as hell. Hopefully, he's okay. Zane Smith ends up finishing second. He nipped uh, Reddick there at the line fantastic run for Zane. At one point, I thought Zane was going to steal this victory, which would have been absolutely massive. Hopefully that gets some of the people off his back being like, oh, he doesn't deserve to be up here. This and that cut him loose. He's overrated. He's not a good prospect. Zane Smith is a really, really good race car driver. He's just in a first year Spire uh, motorsport team in that 71. And they are certainly not a tier one team. Shout out to Corey Heim. He was running top 12 for a decent portion of the day. Uh, ends up getting caught up in a wreck there at the end with Justin Haley in one of those overtimes. Uh, he deserved a far better finish than what he got. That kid is the real deal. Like I said, he is a five-star prospect. Whoever signs him is getting a great, great driver. He can absolutely make that jump from the Truck Series up to the Cup Series next year if he uh, wanted to. So Zane comes second. Uh, his teammate, Corey LaJoy, looked like he was going to finally get his first top 10 on a non-drafting track. And he didn't do it. So Zane got his first top 10 on a non-drafting track before Corey did. Not ideal for Corey LaJoy over there at Spire. And then you also have, here's how you know the race was absolutely chaotic. Daniel Hemrick got a top 10, P9 for Daniel Hemrick. So yeah, things got a little bit crazy there uh, at the end. Ryan Blaney's team had one of the worst strategies I've ever seen. Don't have any idea how they ever thought that was going to work out. He still rebounded for a sixth place finish, but could have been in contention if they just followed what everybody else did. I don't know what Jonathan Hassler was thinking in that situation at all. But overall, the race was pretty decent. I don't need five overtimes. I know it's an unpopular opinion, but you know, it was it, it was a it was a race. I'll give it that. Also, maybe we start running this race uh, at night just to start with. Putting fans out in 90 plus degree temperature on aluminum, you know, uh, benches with no shade doesn't make a lot of sense and putting drivers in hot race car it's 120 plus degrees again stupid they got saved by the rain thankfully uh which pushed it actually they got saved by ty gibbs spinning off a of turn four which prolonged this race uh that caution period rather slowed it down allowed the rain to come before halfway not that i think nascar would have banged it because obviously they still got it in but it certainly ensured that this race would continue to its completion once those storms rolled through so yeah it was it was a race the xfinity race on saturday Saw John Hunter Nemechek pick up uh, a win in that 20 car, which has, you know, obviously been talked about this week with the Eric Almarola situation. He's suspended until July 20th at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway following a fight with Bubba Wallace at a comp meeting or an altercation, rather. Shouldn't call it a fight. We don't actually know uh, if blows were exchanged. I assume so if he gets suspended for it. But John Hunter Nemechek picks up the win. Uh, Chandler Smith comes home second. Looked like Chandler maybe had a shot to get his first win on a non-short track, but didn't get it done. Jesse Love started 38th on Saturday. He comes home with a third place finish. Absolutely gassed after the race. Marty Snyder went down and talked to him and said, you passed 69 nice cars on lap or uh, on track today. What do you think about that? And Jesse looks at him and he goes, ah, Twitter's going to freak out over that one. <laughs> and he was absolutely right. Uh, just great uh, presence of mind for Jesse Love there. Noah Gragson, that number 30 car, gets a top five finish. Great run for, for them as well. Overall, the Xfinity race, I would love to see that race get moved tonight. Those guys were absolutely gassed after the race. Multiple people sitting next to their cars, getting you know ice water poured on them, ice packs thrown into their jacket or their suit jackets, getting thrown into their suits, uh, guys going and getting IVs afterwards. Just a brutal day at the racetrack. And and you could definitely put it at night. Obviously, you had Olympic trials on on Saturday night, so maybe that's why NBC USA didn't want to do it. But man, just for the health of the fans and the drivers, move this, move that race to to the evening, um, and you know at least knock the the beating sun off of them. Truck race on Friday night was uh, the Christian Eckes show. 
he went 150 for 150 laps led just absolutely dominating performance out of Eckes. that's his name's been rumored for uh you know a cup ride over at front row motorsports for 2025 i think that he's a top tier prospect as well he's a quiet guy doesn't he's not flashy uh his, his eighth truck series win he now has what 12 top tens and 13 races for the truck series this year uh, including three wins now i believe so yeah christian eck is just top-notch guy daniel die friend of the program finishes p2 his best career finish great speed out of he and that entire McAnally team obviously Eckes is one of his teammates so it's good to see uh that whole company has speed over there the start of the truck series race though was exactly why the truck series truck series should not be allowed to take a month off those dudes were just running into each other left and right i thought i turned on an arca race at first and then i was like oh this is actually a truck race it started to calm down a little bit but man at the beginning they just kept running into each other and it's like will you guys quit it maybe at this point we don't even take an off season at the end of the year there should be a winter series for some of the back markers where they can at least work on racecraft together and try to not have that happen again but like i said overall good race Eck is dominated the day uh die second Corey heim third Roger Carruth fourth and uh, um, Tyler Ankrum fifth. So McAnally had three trucks in the top five, absolutely flying for them. Instead of doing a dumb move of the weekend this week, we are going to instead talk about John Force real quick. The family gave an update. Obviously, if you don't know, John Force was involved in an accident last weekend at, in Virginia. Uh, the engine blew up. He impacted the wall at 300 mile an hour, bounced, well, he bounced off the other wall, uh, didn't actually make contact with the right side wall, made contact with the left side wall. He ends up getting out of the race car afterwards climbs out under his own power and then is airlifted to the hospital and the family gave an update earlier in the week where they said that he was moved from the icu to the neuro icu which um, obviously indicates some sort of head trauma as well uh on saturday sunday sunday morning they gave a further update a more detailed update and for the first time they said that john did suffer a traumatic brain injury Obviously, if you know anything about TBIs, that's not what you want to hear. Uh, they vary on different levels. We obviously don't know what John Force has, but the family did mention that he has a long road of recovery ahead of him. He is 75 years old after all. It's a big hit. That's a massive hit for anybody to take, especially a 75-year-old man, regardless of how tough he is or not. So the family mentioned that he has a traumatic brain injury, that he didn't really show much progress earlier in the week. He was heavily sedated, and then they moved him into the neuro ICU on Wednesday. He was able to open his eyes, start responding to some commands as well. He murmured his name, John Force, which is a positive. He's able to identify the family members in the room. Mouth, I love you, uh, apparently as well, according to the statement. The doctors did say that he is increasingly agitated and confused, which is very much a symptom of that, especially coming out of sedation as well. They've they said that he's a bit like a raging bull um, <laughs> trying to get out of his bed, which obviously, if you know John Forrest, that fits entirely in there. Uh, he's got a long road uh, to recovery ahead of him. And honestly, like. I just hope that the guy can can recover to have a good life after this. I don't even care about ever seeing him in a race car again. I hate that that was potentially the way he was taken out of a race car because uh, he was still highly competitive this year. He's won two races uh, in 2024 already. But at this point, uh, who cares about racing? Just hope that the guy can have a decent quality of life. After this, uh, his daughter, obviously, Brittany Force, elected to not race this weekend at Norwalk. Uh, his other two cars did. He decided or she decided to stay back in Virginia with the family and be with John, which I think everybody completely understands. So hopefully John Force gets better uh, sooner rather than later. And hopefully his road to recovery is a smooth one and he can have a good quality life. We see him back at the racetrack, even just to support at this point. Moving on to the F1 race on Sunday morning. The sprint race is on Saturday morning, 6 a.m. East Coast time. Listen, I, I got up for it. I went down, sat on the couch, kicked back in the chase lounge, and watched the first five laps, promptly snoozed until about, I don't know, 6.37, I think, was when I woke back up, and they were interviewing Lando. So I was like, okay, well, I clearly missed not that much. Um, rewind rewound the youtube tv there and watched the rest of it and was like yeah that was yeah okay fine whatever decent battle for the first five laps after that not so much the race on sunday looked like max is going to win right he's driving away he's got like a five to eight second lead for most of this race goes in the pits has a bad pit stop puts him back out into traffic a little bit allows lando to get up and buy him get into drs range 
Lando catches him. Lando's doing what Max did back in 2021, attempting to pass people, dive bombing them, pushing them off a racetrack, trying to find any way around him, going up the hill into turn three right there or down the hill into turn four, depending on where it was working at for him. Typically, it was turn three. And then finally, he gets up alongside Max. He has the racing line. He has the outside heading into the corner. All the rubber's right there. He's against the curb. And Max just continues to come over until they hit tires. And it cuts down Max's left rear, damages Lando's car. And then going down the straightaway towards turn four, Max continually tries to push Lando off the track, which I think might actually be more egregious than the first move, which cut the tires down. And George Russell inherits the lead. Funny moment uh, with him where... Total Wolf comes over the radio and he's like, George, you can win this race. And George basically says, shut the F up to him. And then after the race, uh, Toto apologized for getting too excited. And George is like, it's fine. He's like, you got very excited, though. Also, George letting out a, I believe he said, boom shakalaka and yabba dabba do. Strip the wind from him. Take it away from him. That's absolutely unacceptable <laughs> to say on the radio. You sound like a dummy. So that was the only thing that George, well, he also did his T-pose when he got up out of the car, but he picked up his second F1 career win, which is good, and both of his wins now have come after Max has run into people, so there's there's that. Max runs into more people. George can win more races at this point, but the Max thing, Max was complaining about Lando, saying he's not racing properly. He's doing this and that, and he's you know being dangerous. Max built an entire career off of doing the exact same thing. When Max does it, it's fine. When somebody does it to Max, that's when it becomes a big issue. This is what everything that Max was complaining about on Sunday about Lando doing is exactly what Lewis was complaining about Max doing. And at the time, Max was like, no, I'm just racing hard. Well, that's what Lando was doing then, just racing hard. Max was given a 10-second penalty for the contact with Lando leading up into turn three, which cut the tires down, but it ultimately didn't matter. I mean, the guy still limped around on three tires and beat Sergio Perez in the finishing order. Sergio couldn't even beat out a Haas. But yeah, he's the guy to keep for two more years. Hope you're never in a constructor's title battle because the guy's going to be a massive liability at this point. But yeah, Max continually does these things. And I think um, Andrea Stella, the team principal over at McLaren, said it perfectly when Sky talked to him. And he's like, the whole world knows that this is what Max does. And he wasn't punished properly for it in 2021. So now he can continually think that he can do this. And he's right. Max doesn't actually know how. To, Max is a very fast race car driver in a Formula One car when it's Max out front, when he's in qualifying and when he's out front. If Max has to battle for the lead, all he does is run people off the racetrack, make contact or take both cars out. That's his M.O. The guy just cannot race side by side with somebody that's trying to race him for the lead. Just cannot do it. He continually does the same thing. And now that he finally has a challenger again, we're seeing that version of Max come back out. And Lando, to his you know discredit, in a sense, he should have calmed way down. He was constantly on the radio complaining about Max. And I saw Steve Matchett tweet, just get on with it, son. And he's absolutely right. Just pass him. Shut up. Stop keying up the mic and complaining about what Max is doing pass him and then you can worry about that afterwards you're just putting too much of your mental focus into complaining when you should just be focused on what's happening on track so yeah the austrian grand prix turned out to be pretty spicy big fan of that but uh they're now headed to silverstone obviously the british media is not going to treat max very well the british fans aren't going to treat max very well either it'll be interesting to see how all of that plays out this upcoming weekend but i'm excited for it which leads us into our looking ahead segment Looking ahead this weekend, we have the NASCAR Xfinity and Cup Series on the streets of Chicago. Xfinity on Saturday, Cup on Sunday. I will be there for both days. Maybe I'll see you there. We also have Formula One for the British Grand Prix on Sunday morning and IndyCar finally back in action at Mid-Ohio. It will be the first race of the hybrid era for IndyCar as well. That should be pretty interesting. I'm going to have to tune in walking around in Chicago to see how all that plays out. But I'm excited to go to Chicago, come back next week and talk about all of this let me know what you think about all the racing this weekend in the comments. Like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at Break Hard, Instagram and Twitter at Break Hard Blog.